Welcome to Open Source Sustainability. I'm Alex Lassiter, CEO of Green Places. On this show, I talk with sustainability leaders to learn how companies are adapting their business models to be in line with sustainability goals. We believe sustainability has to be open source to be successful, and these leaders have offered us a glimpse inside their strategies in the hopes that we can all move forward together. We're fascinated by some of the unique challenges these sustainability leaders face and are excited to dive deeper. In this episode, I'm talking with Ben Clymer, founder of Hodinkee. Hodinkee has revolutionized the way we buy, sell, and learn about timepieces. With a deep passion for watches and an unwavering commitment to sustainability, Ben has pioneered efforts to create a more conscious and environmentally friendly watch industry through initiatives like Hodinkee Selling and Trading Platform, Eco-Friendly Packaging, and more. Ben, welcome to Open Source Sustainability. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, this morning to chat with us. We're really excited to get into it today with you and talk a little bit about the world of watches and sustainability trends. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, ha- happy to be here. It's a, it's a beautiful, almost summer-like Sunday morning here in, in the New York area, which is kind of hard to believe, but but here we are. Well, I guess to start off with, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, tell us a little about Hodinkee and, uh, and kind of, you know, how this fits into the sustainability mission here. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the, the, you know, the invite to be here today. And so Hodinkee was, was a blog that I started in 2008 really for fun. And this was during, you know, 2008 for, for those of you who might be a little bit younger than, than, than myself, that was the last financial crisis. And so a company called Lehman Brothers, which hasn't existed for about 15 years, collapsed in 2008. And that sent the world of finance, which is where I was working, into like total turmoil. Like really like, you can't even fathom how crazy it was today, back back then. Uh, and so, so I was, you know, low man on the totem pole. I was a kid. I was 24 years old working at UBS. I'd been there less than a year. And they basically gave me the opportunity to leave with a severance. And like, you know, severance was not, you know, any golden parachute or anything like that. This was probably like, you know, I think I said somewhere else recently, I think it was like $12,000. But like at the time, my rent was like $900. So like that was great for me, you know. Uh, and I was living with my girlfriend at the time. And like, you know, it was just like a very easy way of life. And I said, man, like if I'm ever going to change my career, now is the time to do it. And I'd always fancied myself as a writer. Um, and I said, man, like, like, I wonder if I can make a living as a journalist, like a proper journalist. And so I started blogging for fun about a watch that my grandfather gave me, an Omega Speedmaster, really just to kind of get my chops uh, in writing. And the blog started to get more traffic. And then eventually uh, the then editor in chief of GQ reached out and said, hey, you know, you're the first guy under the age of 50 to write about watches effectively. You're certainly the, the first kind of like New York LA type of kind of like coastal guy to write about watches from a from a different perspective of one where like, hey, this is this is accepting. This is democratic. This is fun and welcoming. It's not like some hoity-toity rich guy thing. Would you want to write for GQ? And of course, I said yes. And I think the posts were I think that I was getting paid around seventy five dollars per post or something like that. But it it was, it was a way for me to kind of practice as a journalist. And I ended up writing or leveraging that into writing for sites called Ask Men, um, GQ, Fortune, Forbes, uh, Financial Times, How to Spend It, Esquire here and there, you know, really great publications. Ended up applying to journalism school in, in New York, uh, got in somehow, some way based on my watch blog, basically. Uh, and then after that, kind of went off to the races, did two years of a master's degree in journalism at, at Columbia here in the city. Um, and then in 2012, went full time into Hodinkee and, you know, back then it was it was really a media business we were we were selling advertisements uh, we quickly got into e-commerce in 2012 we started selling straps like little straps for for watches which i was designing um and then from there the site just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then in 2014 i had the opportunity to to sell the, the business and it was you know a small three-person company to a big business here in new york and instead of doing that a friend of mine named tony fidel who um created the iPhone and iPod for Apple and then Nest for Google, you know, just serial entrepreneur, one of the smartest guys I know, he'd become kind of a mentor. And he's like, dude, do not sell this business. Like it's way too early. This is something way too special. Like, let me help you raise money. Uh, so Tony Fidel invested about half a million dollars of his own money. He connected me and helped me with uh, a few other investors. And so around 2015, 2016, we said, hey, what if we like became an authorized dealer for watches on on the internet? And which was something that was completely foreign at the time. Nobody had done it at all. We became, we in fact accomplished that which was not any easy task in 2017, we became the first authorized to watch this on the internet anywhere in the world, any language, et cetera. Uh, and that was really kind of like when the door kind of kicked open to saying like, wait a minute, this could be like a substantial business. And certainly, you know, we have grown this thing into, you know, what I would say is kind of like the archetypal content community commerce business. So if you Google content to commerce, like we are, you know, we are often the the, the use case or the, the the case study there because this began as a pure blog written by one guy in, in me in, in this case that then led into like really a, a, like a meaningful media property where we were making, you know, a few million dollars 
a year selling advertisements, which is still not wasn't easy then. It's not easy now. And uh, and then we leveraged that into a community of people that loved us and trusted us so much that they actually wanted to buy things from us. And now, you know, we we still continue to say that we are a content community commerce community, of course, being like active comment section. I mean, the average story gets around 50 to 60 comments per, per wow. story, which is like, you know, we're writing about watches. Like what, like how, what could you possibly have to say? Like how much is there to say about a new watch? Turns out people have a lot of opinions and they, they have a very high opinion of their own opinion. Um, and so we allow them to, to give them the platform to kind of, you know, kind of verbalize those opinions and, and debate and debate they will. Um, but right now we do, you know, about a hundred million dollars in sales per year, uh, between new watches and, and pre-owned watches. We have, um, podcasts, we have blogs, we have YouTube channels. I just did a, a, a really fun video with Kermit the Frog yesterday that was on the site uh, which was really fun uh, but we do a series called Talking Watches which which hosts usually by me uh, the likes of like Kevin Hart and Ed Sheeran and John Mayer you know insert any you know semi-famous person here and uh, it's really fun because you know it allows people to connect with the space in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise you know i think watches historically have a really kind of pretentious and and very european kind of slant to them that is uh can be perceived as unfriendly and i think you know as, as some people on this call know like both my parents are public school teachers i don't come from a world of kind of luxury at all but i still appreciate the craft and, and everything that goes into it and so hodinky has become the home for people that identify with that um, to, to tie this back to, I guess, where you started your career at Hodinkee, um, at the last financial crisis and obviously finished it, or I guess, uh, took that next step at another crisis with, uh, with COVID. I was actually taking a capital markets final, uh, when Lehman brothers, uh, collapsed and my teacher, I remember, uh, was crying. Um, so while we were taking a test that I think I eventually failed, um, she was just in full tears, um, just crying as the markets were, were, were melting down. Yeah, as I said, I just don't think anybody. I mean, you you were there, uh, but like, I just don't think people younger than us would have any idea of how crazy that particular time frame was. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, like we, I had you know, grown men, grown women. My my managing directors again. I was you know low man on the totem pole, but my bosses like being like, oh my god, is this the end of all finance as we know it? And of course it wasn't, <laughs> but it's like it really was that that crazy of a time, uh, and it was the perfect time for me to jettison into something else, like to really get yeah. so like, hey, like this is really not for me. And you know, a lot of it came down to just the humanity of it, and like the the, the work was the work. I knew what the work was before going into yeah. it. Effectively, I didn't end up connecting with it, but it was more the 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 lack of humanity. And that's not to disparage my former employer or finance in general, but at that time, it was a really kind of every man for themselves mindset. And so I saw people that had spent 20, 25 years at the company that I was employed at just being treated as if they didn't matter at all. And like, of course, like, these people have families, these people have colleges and more, you know, college uh, educations to pay for and mortgages and things like that. And all of a sudden, like they were just showed very little regard and that just didn't feel great to me. Uh, and so I wanted to do something in, entirely different. And, and so I did. And uh, certainly the best decision I've ever made. I, I'm with you. I quit my job at uh, at 24 as well and started my first company. It, those situations are funny because um, most people, I feel like, come to that realization a little bit later in their careers of this isn't working. There's something I'm interested in. I want to go after and do it. But sometimes a sometimes it can take a global catastrophe um, to be able to spin a lot of people out earlier to go create things. And I am actually pretty curious with COVID how many folks have kind of done the same thing um, as they started to think about where they wanted to be. Um, now, we know we didn't start this to talk about um, entrepreneurship, um, but it is a super interesting story. So I, I want to get back into watches because you said something interesting to me, which is, you know, you didn't come from a background of, of watches uh, or of, of luxury, maybe is a, is a right way to think about it. But you mentioned that you were what drew you to this was something about watches being obviously an appreciation of of the craftsmanship. I, for one, uh, what interests me in the in the space is is kind of the stories of it. I wear my granddad's watch. I'm pretty sure he bought it for $20 in the 70s. I think it's still probably worth $20 today. But I love it because it's my favorite memory of him. And it's it's what I remember as a kid when he was helping me learn to fish, helping me learn to do things. I remember seeing it on his arm. Now I get to see it on mine. I can think about seeing it on my son's arm. And so for me, it's always been about that heirloom quality of things. And so one of the things we're obviously going to talk about today is the sustainability story of watches, because I think historically sustainability and consumer goods or sustainability and luxury items are not, those are separate things. Um, but, but that's changed a lot. 
So maybe talk to me first about how does sustainability fit in with Hodinkee's mission? What do you think broadly about this? And, 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 and maybe talk to me about y'all's place in the world of sustainability today. Yeah, I, I think I think two things worth kind of mentioning. First is like the definition of luxury is literally something you don't need, right? Like it's 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 something beyond your yeah. your base base necessity. So you would think that like as, as you said, you know that like the idea of something in luxury that that is sustainable is is kind of like it's an oxymoron. Like it doesn't make any sense. But when you look at and 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 I think to some degree that that is an accurate thought. And I think it's that that's a sound kind of directional thought. When you look at fashion, when you look at cars, right? I mean, like you know, looking at a, a brand new electric. You know, Porsche or an electric uh, Tesla today, you know, these cars cost whatever. And like, you know, these batteries will have to go somewhere. And like th- these cars will not be on the road in, in 50 mm-hmm. years. Like we, we know that definitively. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at shoes, clothes, whatever, those will not be around in 50 years. You can't wear, I mean, I guess you could wear your grandfather's sweater or whatever from the 50s, but it would be difficult to, to maintain it for sure. Meanwhile, you look at watches and, and jewelry, and I really view watches as a separate category from jewelry for my own reasons, but I know a lot of people kind of group them together. You're looking at, in fact, the most sustainable, the most long-lasting physical items that anybody can um can buy. And these are luxury in the sense that, yeah, of course you don't need them to survive. And, you know, nobody would ever say that you you, you do. And I would be the first among them. Um, but these are luxury items that actually have incredible longevity and incredible respect for the environment. And, and these are things made out of, you know, effectively raw materials that are shaped in many cases by hand, you know, up until the 80s, uh, they were shaped by hand, you know, before CNCs, before CAD, etc. You know, these things were, were genuinely shaped by hand. So it would be, um, it would be kind of silly to say that these are, are luxury in the sense that like, these are items that are short lasting. And these items are things that will be kind of uh, turned around quickly and kind of thrown into a garbage dump. And then you have to, you know, kind of go in, into the the world to kind of recreate uh, you know there are, i've got a watch on my desk that is from 1963 and and by the way like it, it's it still works and this is not a plant this is just sitting here uh, but this watch is 60 years old and i think that's pretty remarkable that like this thing is still around today and so the idea of, of mechanical watches and, and items like this are really inherently sustainable in a way that i don't think many people understand then you come into the idea of actual like premeditated sustainability within our own company and within some of our partner companies, you know, you have things like Fairmind Gold, which is like are, are actually predetermined and, and pre-designed to premeditated to be sustainable. And so you have Recycled Gold, Chopard, which is a partner brand of ours. We were an authorized dealer of theirs, sells products and creates products out of Fairmind Gold. And they were amongst the first to do that. Within Hodinkee, like sustainability has always just been kind of core to what we do. And like, it wasn't like we set out to be a sustainable company. We just set out to be a world-class company. We wanted to be a company that treated treated our employees, our partner brands, and the environment and the world in which we live with the utmost respect. And I think we, we've done that. And that, that goes back as far as probably 2016. We began looking at the way that watches and straps and everything sold in, in kind of like luxury goods were packaged. And what you would see is you'd see a watch that's about, you know, 39 millimeters in diameter, which is like, you know, the size of your thumb or two thumbs maybe, being packaged in, a, in what appeared to be like a briefcase, you know, really like, you know, let's say three foot by two foot rectangle with leather and you know, and and steel and cushioning and I mean, all these like kind of crazy facets, etc. And that just made no sense. It also like as a watch collector, which I, you know, you wouldn't be surprised to learn I am. What do you do with all this stuff? Like it just doesn't make any sense. And so I was, you know, I was living in Manhattan at the time in a tiny little apartment and I really had no room. I had to get storage units to put boxes for watches. In, and I was like, this makes absolutely no sense. So when we became an authorized dealer for watches in 2017, we actually went out and created our own packaging that was completely sustainable. We actually were the first people to do that. We actually asked the partner brands if we could not include their packaging. Some of them mm. said yes. Some of them said no. But to, to even ask that was kind of like it was completely crazy. I mean, it was a totally foreign idea that like people were, were, were OK with getting less when you were paying, say, five, six or you know, more thousand dollars per mm. for, for a watch. Um, and it turns out that a lot of people really wanted that for a thousand reasons. I mean, one of the reasons, A, is storage. Like, what am I going to do with it? But beyond that, we, we saw and it, it really kind of escalated or, or, or became much more kind of a, a thing during covid you saw younger people buying watches mechanical Mm. watches and with that you have people that are just more cognizant of sustainability and the environment and so again the idea of you know delivering a 39 millimeter watch in a packaging that probably weighs 40 pounds and is made of stuff that like we'll never use again was was almost offensive you know to a lot of people's kind of intellect and a lot of people's um kind of ethical viewpoint of of toward or towards what sustainability should be and what luxury should be right i mean if you have the, the 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 air quotes luxury of being able to afford these 
things, you should be respectful about it. Like you shouldn't take advantage of any situation. Uh, and so we were the first and remain uh, certainly the probably the largest proponent of sustainability within the, the watch category. Several brands have followed suit now. And now you'll see small or small and big brands selling watches in, you know, something like this. I'm holding up my iPhone, but effectively imagine a little leather case like this that folds over on itself and and, and you could fit a watch in there. Uh, so we were among the first to, to do that. And, and I think, you know, definitely set, uh, you know, kind of a standard there. But everything we do is is really to be mindful of, of you know, the world around us. And I think, you know, ranging from everything from the way that we uh, sell straps. So the strap business for us is, is a really, really, I should say, was foundational to our business. So it was among, among the first things we ever started selling on the internet. Um, and, you know, we ensure that, you know, everything that we that we source there is absolutely the most sustainable, the most ethical, um, you know, the way that the, the, the leather is produced effectively. I mean, we all know where that comes from. We want to ensure that the farms that we're using and everything that we're using is are, are treated kind of the right way. And I think, you know, there's a lot of way, there's a lot of people in 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 our world in kind of like the, the luxury world that like really just don't care about that. And again, I think for us, it wasn't it wasn't a conscious decision to be air quote sustainable. It was just more about being having integrity in everything we do. And you know the way we treat our employees, the way we compensate our employees, the way we treat everything that we do, we just want to do it with the utmost integrity. And and sustainability falls right in line with that. Yeah, we, we talk a lot on this show um, to uh, people in all different industries, whether it's we've talked to, to Taco Bell and talked about uh, uh, hot sauce packets. We've talked to Ben and Jerry's and, and how to feed cows better. Um, and the, the, the theme that I keep hearing is not this like regressive idea of sustainability where it's we need to reduce the value of what we have. It's actually more of a progressive view. And it's like this continuation of being smarter and being more educated on things, you know, moving, moving from a packaging that's like this big to be able to sell something this big is not just wasteful. It's not even, it, to me, it's not even the, the smartest way to do things. There's a better way to operate and learning and understanding how to do these things can actually help improve the operations of your business. It can be more efficient for your bottom line. It can be better for a business. It can be better for the consumer. At the end of the day, it can be even a better experience because I agree with you when you get, when you buy anything, whether it's a watch, uh, you know, or um, uh, you know, or an iPhone or anything else, it becomes comical to think how many boxes. I mean, half of what I do, it feels like, is breaking down boxes. Absolutely, from anything. And so, I, I love the idea of being able to look at it from that perspective because it's a better customer experience. Opening that that watch is a big reason. It, it is, and I, I, I mean that—that's exactly it. And I think you know, you—you you kind of touched on something we really studied when when we were designing our packaging back in 2015, 16. It's like, look, I mean, I'm going to give the utmost credit to, to Apple because they deserve it, but their out of package experience is incredible. Like before them, like your phone was the the phone or the product you were taking out of the box wasn't charged, so yep. you spent you know save up buy your your new MP3 player or whatever, um, and it's not charged. Like that's crazy. And Apple changed all that. And so I mean that that's just one example, but the way that they handle packaging is is simply remarkable. And so we we studied what they do. We looked at what they do, and it is reduction of packaging in, in, in the utmost of ways. And I mean, now they don't even give you, um, they don't even give you the charging port. They just give you the cable because they know that, you know, A, they can sell you that. And B, <laughs> you probably have 25 of them sitting around. And I think like that is at once respectful to to, to the consumer and helps their bottom line in, in a certain way. And I think that is what people are looking for today. And again, it just became, it, there was a generational shift in, in our industry. And in my industry is, is both luxury, but also like actual e-commerce. Like, you know, we look at the Mr. Porters and the Nikes and everybody in e-commerce and they're their benchmarks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it it didn't become necessary, but it became almost necessary probably by 2020, around when COVID kind of came around, to really be to really be a part of this this movement. And again, we organically were, so we didn't have to change much. Um, but we would be remiss to 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 be, you know, what we claim to be a world class company. And we've been we've been, you know, nominated for most innovative companies three or four times, et cetera. Like we just have to hold the mantle of of this category, the watch category and the kind of like luxury e-commerce category so so respectfully that we want to make sure that we're pushing things always. And that includes, again, you know, even just the, the diversity of the people within our company. Like we just want this, this company to be progressive in every way, even though we're selling things that are like kind of by definition unnecessary and also by definition kind of antiquated, right? Like nobody needs a watch. Like my iPhone tells better time than the IWC on my wrist. But, you know, we think it's important that, the, that people understand kind of both sides of the coin in, in, in this particular case. We talked a little bit about packaging and sustainability. Um, I want to pull back to a, another point that you mentioned, um, which is this idea of pre-owned um, being a more obviously sustainable choice. Um, and you mentioned something that was interesting to me, which was younger people are buying more watches. 
And I'm curious, um, I've seen a lot, um, actually, uh, was reading the other day about kind of the, 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 the blowback against e-readers and younger generations to move towards actual paper books and being able to actually pick something up and use bookstores are popping up all over the country and, um, rare bookstores are popping up all over the country. And there's this push back to more of an analog world. And I don't know if some of that happens to be a drive towards a time that was more minimalist. Is it a pushback against everything that's coming? But I'm curious if we're seeing anything for that. And is that driving people back to a time where, you know, Hey, I, I actually would value something that's older and that's already here versus something that's new and feels consumptive. Yeah, I, th I think I think yes. I mean, I think you know, blanket statement, yes, a hundred percent. But I, I think it's it's that coupled with several other factors. And I think you know, the you know, COVID, we all we all remember all too fondly or all too all too clearly that like you know, you, the money that you may have been spending on that vacation to Hawaii or wherever with your wife, girlfriend, family was now impossible to spend because you know you were sitting at home, you literally couldn't leave your house. And so the idea of assets like physical assets just became incredibly in vogue at the time. And it's not just watches. It was wine. It was collectible cars. It was uh, trading cards. It was anything. So th there's that coupled with this idea that all of a sudden these things see inherent appreciation, which is which is a fallacy, right? Like that's not reality. There's nothing that sees inherent appreciation. But the consensus was up until basically six months ago that if you bought, we'll say a Rolex, a used Rolex at retail or around retail, that it would always go up. And like that, I know that not to be the, the case. I'm sure you do too. But a lot of people believe that you buy a Porsche, you buy a Rolex at the right price, it'll always go up. So you got to, you got to see a lot of younger kind of like less educated consumers buying products like like but we'll say Rolexes mm -hmm. in this case. Then on the flip side, you have exactly what you said, which is this idea that like there, you're just inundated with technology. You're inundated with um, with digital ephemera nonstop. I mean, really to a degree that is is. I mean, I don't think I don't think anybody would disagree that this is universally unhealthy for all minds, yes. but in particular like young minds that, that are still kind of malleable. And all of a sudden you say, well, wait a minute, like it, instead of using looking at my iPhone, like I like here I could look at my mechanical watch. And by the way, it says something about me which is something that always really stuck with me even you know many years ago. It's like, okay, look, like I am like I'm going to I I wore probably a blue, a blue polo shirt like this that I'm wearing now when I was probably 8 years old. I'm still wearing it and I'll wear it when I'm 80 years old. Like that this is who I am and that's okay. But I have other ways of expressing kind of who I am and a watch can can be one of them. And so you get to see and there's a lot of people like that out there that might not be dressed in haute couture or some crazy, you know, crazy look, but they want something that expresses who they are and a watch is a great way to do that. But back to the idea of kind of like the, this digital uh Digital drowning really is what it is, and, and Tony Fidel bring bring it back to him. I mean, he's been an advocate of that, which is amazing because he was in, you know he created the iPhone, um, and uh, you know he's really very very keen on limiting the time that, in particular, children have access to to digital devices. And you know we are a digital company; we are online very much. So we're opening our first store later this year in Soho, but we are a digital e commerce seller selling things that the, you don't need. But again, these items provide a functionality to you that is available elsewhere, but not in this kind of emotional way and not in this way that is actually helpful to your mind as opposed to destructive to your mind. And then, I mean, that doesn't even go into the fact of what, you know, what a TikTok or an Instagram or whatever actually does to, to a young mind. And these are, we know this is not me speaking ill of them. This is fact. Like they have been designed mm -hmm. to suck people in and effectively change their mind to, to, to need them. It's a drug. I mean, it is literally a drug the way that, that it treats your mind. Um, and so I think the idea of, you you know, as you said, analog paper books, you know, vinyl is really popular right now. Um, classic cars, which is something that's really popular right now, certainly mechanical watches. It's not a surprise that like when you tip so far to one direction of the boat, it starts to kind of tip too far. And all of a sudden, like you realize this thing might tip over. So you run to the other side. And I think something that I've always prided myself in is like, I'm always one of the first or I try to be one of the first to run to the other side and kind of bounce the boat out, so to speak. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing with, with watches. And as you said, paper books and vinyl stereos, et cetera. Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I've got three, three young kids and, and the oldest is, is, is just about to turn six. And I was always really nervous about bringing my phone out in front of him all the time because I didn't want him to be always looking at a phone when he turns 12 or 15 or whatever, when, when we decide to get him a phone. But it occurred to me the other day when he was telling me to put my phone down that I don't think he's going to do that. I think the way that he perceives it is a little bit of the way that when I was a kid, I perceived like smoking. You know, I saw my parents and said, oh, like, how could you possibly do that? How could you live in the 80s or 70s and and do this and absolutely know that this is bad? And I'm thinking like, man, I'm, I'm holding this this phone and I'm looking at it all the time and it's a, directing all my attention. 
Like this is kind of my version of that. We know it's not good for us. And so whether it's getting an analog watch or moving back towards a regressive state of something else, it is a way to be able to kind of break free of that type of stuff and calm ourselves and kind of save the attention that we have for the things that really matter. And yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. And I think, you know, I, I could go on a whole kind of diatribe on, on other things like that. Like I think sugar, like I think sugar to our children's generation would be like, what were you doing eating chocolate chip cookies and cupcakes and all that? I think alcohol is something yep. that like, it like, it is like, you know, we can, we can go back to sustainability shortly, but like alcohol is crazy. Like I'm not, a, I mean, I, I drink socially, et cetera, but I'm not a huge drinker, but like it is verified to be horrible for anybody yep. that consumes it. You know, like why would we continue to do that? You know? And I really believe, and we're already starting to see it. I mean, if you look at like Gen Z, which is, I think a generation probably a little bit younger than both of us, um, you know, these, these, these younger folks are just not drinking the way that we probably did at, at, at their yep. age and, and things shift so quickly. And I think you're right. I think the idea of digital consumption will really like it's it's a necessary thing you need to you know having google maps on your phone is a great mm-hmm. thing that that makes life easier for sure but living and breathing on instagram and tiktok and, and other things like that that are in, in, you know in some cases and you know inarguably kind of designed to to kind of treat your your brain as if it's almost like a uh it's 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 just it's part of their life source like they need your brain they need your or anybody's attention span to continue to to grow so they're the it's fuel for them um so yeah i, I think it's as, as you said the idea of like kind of aggressive uh concepts like like what we said mechanical watches etc is is really kind of a it's 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 you know in many cases like i i you know we would never take any credit for that at all like this is just something that's happening in in life but i do think we've provided a nice foundational kind of platform for people to get really excited about it and kind of foster their, their love for for these things absolutely um well i want to talk a little bit about uh because obviously you're an expert in the watch industry you've seen You've seen you've seen a lot. Um, so talk to me a little bit about some of the, the the watches that you see on the market today, whether they are on the pre-owned side or as you mentioned, kind of a premeditated green. Um, uh, what are you seeing? Do you have any watches that that you like? Would love to hear a little bit about some of the some of the green watches that 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 you like on sure. the market today. Yeah, that, 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 that's great. I think like first of all, you know, as as I mentioned in 2021, we purchased a company called Chronic Caliber, kind of more near neck of the woods than we are down in Atlanta, Georgia, mm-hmm. and. It's an amazing business that a you know what we try to do is is look. I mean, we are a for profit business, just like you know ninety nine percent of other businesses out there. We want to build something that is financially and fiscally sustainable while doing good. And I think like those do not have to be mutually exclusive. And so this business solves a lot of problems for a lot of people. And a big problem when you own a watch is like, okay, let's say I'm having a child or whatever. I want to buy a new car or I need a new car uh, or my dad gets sick. You need to sell that watch. And so buying a watch is, is pretty easy. You go onto our site, you go to a watch store, you just put down your credit card and buy it. Selling one is, is actually very, very difficult. Mm. And so what Crown & Caliber and now Hodinkee does is we found, we think the best way to, to buy watches from consumers. So if you say, hey, I've got this old Omega or Rolex, we have a, a process on, on Hodinkee now. We can give you effectively an instant quote. You will, will, you know, instantly, this is all automated. We'll ship you a FedEx label that's insured. And as soon as we get it and verify that it's real or whatever, we'll send you a check. And, you know, th- that's amazing. And I think like a, a process like that didn't really exist short of going into your local mom and pop jeweler and hope that they would, A, have the, the ability to buy it and, and B, you know, actually want it. So we we purchased this business in 2012 and now the majority of our revenue comes from pre-owned sales. And we're just starting wow. to see all of the things that we've been talking about for the past 30 minutes here, like all of the things kind of coming to a head coupled with this inherent kind of um, demand spike in watches where you yep. can't get a lot of these watches that Retail, like they just don't exist. It's supply demand stuff, um, and all of a sudden, pre-owned is in fact the, the most popular way to buy a watch today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, not only is it the easiest, but it is also the most sustainable, and that is absolutely a factor in in a lot of people's buying decisions here. Uh, and so, pre-owned is for at least for the past two years has been foundational to our business and really changed who we are as a company. Um, you know, it's a lot. You know, bluntly speaking, it's a lot more labor intensive for us. There's a lot more involved with it. We're buying and selling. Um, as opposed to, you know, the modern business where we're, you know, we're getting stuff directly from manufacturer and shipping it out. Um, but it, it, it allows us to feel better about A, what we're doing, mm-hmm. and B, it provides an amazing service to, um, to, to the consumer. So that pre-owned is, is, is a big, big part of the watch industry today. And the growth that you saw, like all those Bloomberg headlines and Wall Street Journal headlines of like Rolex prices outperform S&P 500 and, and all that, like that is, that is purely based on the pre-owned market, 100%, yep. uh, which is interesting that that is now kind of like the centerpiece of where like the mainstream media covers the watch category. Um, 
And then in terms of people that are being really thoughtful about it, and by people, I mean brands in most cases, Chopard, as I mentioned, is is probably, not probably, is is definitely the kind of global leader for Fairmine Gold in, in the watch mm. and jewelry category. They are working with things and they're working with silicon uh, as opposed to using kind of traditional raw materials as well that is a little bit more sustainable than than your typical kind of oscillating weights and we won't go down that road because it's it's a, it's a very nerdy one um brightling is doing a lot with their straps uh we see a lot of people pulling away from a you know exotic straps are because of something called CITES, which makes them very difficult to get them into the United States. And also, it's just like, it's just not humane and not sustainable at all Mm -hmm. to continue to produce exotic straps. So what I mean, like Mm -hmm. alligator, crocodile, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quickly people moved away from those type of exotics into calf, which is far more uh, available. And then from there, people have moved into actually uh, sustainable, recycled straps. almost kind of like a nylon style straps. Mm. Uh, and that mm. includes the one that I'm wearing right now on, on the side of UC. Uh, and, you know, the, the strap business, I mean, let, uh, Rolex alone produces a million watches per year, right? So there's a lot oh, of straps yeah. there. So we're talking about, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of, of watches going out, go, new watches going out into the world each year. So think about the straps required for that. So it's just a massive kind of shift in in what people care about, Um uh, to, to say that, okay, we're no longer going to put leather straps on those, whatever, 100 million watches that are made every single year. Mm-hmm. You also, and this is kind of, might sound silly, but it's actually true. The most popular watches in the world right now are those on bracelets. So ones like like this that have a kind of a metal bracelet like that. Huh. Yeah. And of course, no straps involved there. So so no leather goods at all on, on, on those watches. And in this watch, which is a, you know, a, a, a nice one, you know, the package that, that this watch came in was literally a cube about the size of a baseball, you know, and the idea that a watch of this caliber, which is a relatively high one, comes in in a product like that, and it's it's synthetic leather. It's not even real leather, which is by design, of course. Um, you're starting to see brands like this is a company called Audemars Piguet, um, Patek Philippe, you know, really really high end brands um, pay attention to to things like this that they just weren't paying attention to at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, not not only ten years ago, but three years ago. It really, I, I think, COVID changed everything um, because the consumer of of our products. I mean, even on Hodinkee, the average consumer on Hodinkee, the age went from thirty five to thirty in mm-hmm. three years. Mm-hmm. So as we all got older, our consumer got younger. And those are, the, those are the consumers. So if you talk about the people that are reading our site, you have people even younger still. Um, and so we just have – we and the entire industry just have to kind of be aware of what's happening in, in reality. Otherwise, again, as I've said five times, nobody needs this stuff. And I think people would very happily just say, all right, if these guys aren't going to respect the things that we care about, I'm just going to go not buy a watch at all, use my iPhone, and spend the money on a vacation to Hawaii, as I said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about that is, um, is as I'm hearing you talk about it, um, these are just really interesting stories to learn about. Like, there's a lot of education in this, and I know that, as you mentioned, kind of Hodinkee got it started as a, you know, a content platform. It started as a blog of telling stories of these things, and the sustainability story of this, whether it's Fairmind Gold or uh, a recycled strap or the benefits of a metal strap or uh, a silicon versus uh, and it was an oscillating weight. Um, that's just a fascinating story for people to learn about. And I think part of the reason that I'd like, like I said, I mean, the reason that I have the watch that I have is because it has a story element to it. I get to learn about it, I get to think about it. And I imagine there's a lot of opportunities uh, on the Hodinkee site um, to be able to learn uh, about the sustainable choices that they can make that align with kind of their views and how they want to kind of tell their own story. So what kind of resources do y'all have and and kind of dedicate towards educating, you know, a consumer on the different options they have and and what this might mean uh, for that impact on the environment um, or the, the, the resources that we have? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Hodinkee publishes five stories a day every day of the week. Uh, so, you know, we have thousands, literally thousands of stories on everything you could want to p- potentially learn about watches, including uh, the, the most kind of sustainable and green choices for, for watches. And I'll, I can send you a link to that later. We, I, I should mention also that there's another company out there called, called Rolex, which I'm sure most of us have heard about. Um, they actually, their watches themselves are relatively sustainable, no use of leather, no use of, of, of you know, kind of I mean, things like that, 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 that could be considered kind of you know, anti to, to this movement. But what they also do is they support, and Rolex has incredible means. I mean, the biggest watch company on earth by far. They support uh, ocean initiatives to an extreme mm-hmm. degree. And so they actually partner with the likes of James Cameron and, you know, just mega names like that uh, to, to, do, to, to support people that are doing incredible work towards the sustainability of the oceans in particular. Rolex is such a forward thinker and so 
so many ways, and they've become this dominant player, really not just in watches, but in you know in brands in general. Um, you know, by thinking so far ahead on on things like this, that's great, and it's great to hear that these 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 gigant. I mean, these are huge companies um, are thinking about this not from a perspective of this is a flash in the pan moment and it's a quick response to what we do, but these are like fundamentally changing the way that these watches are manufactured and how these materials are sourced. These are big, big supply chain decisions. Yeah, they, I mean, for for a brand like Rolex and, and Breitling and Chopard, no doubt. But I think even for a company like like ours, and we are dramatically smaller than any of them, but yeah. you know, it's it's just become kind of part of our DNA. And if you asked, if you asked, and this is on us, but if you asked most of our employees that have joined us in the past two years, like, how does Hodinkee's packaging differ from another retailer's? Like, I don't even know that they would know another way because they step in and they say okay they see these the packaging that's like this instead of like this and they're like yeah like that that makes sense because this is the year 2023 and like yep it just it just is common sense and i think if they were to go into a more traditional retailers operations and see the way that they handle things i think they'd be shocked and granted a lot of our employees and a lot of our coworkers are, are younger you know they are slightly more progressive you know i don't want to say anything is taken for granted for, for by, by what we do but we've been doing this for so long and it's just a part of who we are that it's like there's just no there's no optionality here it's not it's not a profit driver it's not it, it actually does save us money here and there but like that's not why we do it like we just do it because it's the right thing to do and i think that's you know an amazing way or that's the optimal way to run any business it's like just, just feel good in my bones just feel good between my, my thumb and forefinger and if it does then then you should do it where do you think this is going um you know 10 20 30 years from now how do you think the watch landscape uh will change um as as we think more about um climate change and 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 uh resources whether it's water uh or or rare minerals or whatever it might be how does the watch industry change in the future in your opinion what do you think yeah, it's 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 a good question. I mean, I think like the, the all the things that you just mentioned are very much a part of the equation. And then the other part of the equation, which is like the just is part of like the circular economy, which is people like the real reels and sites like ours that are buying and selling pre-owned watches like nobody needs to 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 buy brand new stuff anymore. You know, you can buy, mm-hmm. buy stuff that has already been made or has been lightly enjoyed by somebody else. And you don't you know, it doesn't it doesn't change a lot of your your user experience at all. The other thing that the other the other kind of X factor driving factor in, in in our world is that the market for watches has gone uh, gone dramatically up market. So hmm. quartz watches, which are battery powered watches, which mm-hmm. produce waste obviously because there's batteries there, um, those were those were and are you know the majority of watches on Earth since the creation of the of the Apple Watch and uh, you know always bring it back to, to those guys they know what they're doing since the creation of the Apple Watch the market for quartz watches which again are like the watches you'd see at Walmart or Costco or something like that mm-hmm. or less expensive has been decimated mm-hmm. in a great way and what I mean by that is like those those watches have really no I don't want to say no place in the world anymore, but a much smaller place than they did pre-Apple Watch. And so if you look at a company called Fossil, which is a great American story, and Fossil, mm-hmm. you know, they make fashion watches, mostly quartz. They were trading at around $90 a share before the mm-hmm. Apple Watch. I haven't looked at the share price recently, but last time I looked, which was probably two years ago, they were at about $7 a share, mm-hmm. right? So the, and, and this is, you know, again, nothing against Fossil at all, but it just shows you how big of an impact the smartwatch world has had on on um, on quartz watches. Then you have our world, um, which is high in mechanical world, and things are moving away from quartz watches in such a material way that now we basically only sell mechanical watches, so watches that mm. don't require battery in any way. And so with that, you have smart watches are there's a lot of them, but you know when they're made by Apple and Samsung and companies that are like very progressive, like the risk of waste is is dramatically lower than you would have from a fossil or from you know mm-hmm. kind of a, a lesser company like that. Um, so all of a sudden, the, I think just inherently that coupled with everything that you mentioned, plus the circular economy, I think the watch industry in general is going to be far more respectful of the environment and far more sustainable than ever before. And a lot of it is premeditated. A lot of it is through through you know kind of thought leaders such as yourself. And a lot of it a lot of it is just the inherent nature of how people are consuming products today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think with. Uh... With y'all's acquisition uh, of Crown and Caliber, um, I feel like the story that I'm hearing is if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a watch, buy one that lasts, and if it doesn't, you have a place to put it. Um, and there's a market. That's exactly now. it. There's a market now to get it back out there and at a fair price and a place where you know it's gonna find a good home and you can feel comfortable about you know what you're purchasing has a has has a continuous use case, you know, for generations to come. 
That's exactly um, it. That's exactly. And that, that's, that's, that's always been the goal is like tell stories and like, you know, kind of create the emotional connection to these things that last forever. And, you know, again, the watch that my grandfather gave me will be with me forever with my daughter, or with my son, whoever down the road. And that's just an amazing thing from a sentimental perspective. It's also an amazing thing from a sustainability perspective. And like the, the thing, and to be clear, like I could sell all the other ones and just have the one watch that my grandfather had. And it would work just fine, you know, and it would require very little maintenance, very little servicing from now until really in perpetuity. Uh, and that is a pretty remarkable thing about the watch category. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Well, Ben, this has been a great conversation. I I'd sincerely appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to come chat with us. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I appreciate you sharing your story. I think for listeners, head to Hodinkee. Um, learn more about uh, the sustainable choices you can make in watches, obviously in pre-end, but also in terms of this premeditated, more sustainable options. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And, and, and Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Thank you to Ben for joining us. And thank you for listening. If you like this show, please be sure to leave us a review and follow this podcast wherever you like to listen so you don't miss an episode. This podcast is powered by Green Places. If you're looking to reduce your company's environmental impact and reach your sustainability goals, visit greenplaces.com to learn more. I'm Alex Lassiter, and I'll talk with you next time on Open Source Sustainability.